Uh, this was referred to as the keynote address, but I don't want to give it any such pompous title. It's just some opening remarks which try to signpost the territory, the issues that we are going to discuss in the next few days. It was a sense of the deep, deep concern at the state of India's rivers that led to the idea of organizing this India Rivers Week 2014. What I shall try to do is to present a broad overview of the vast subject, the many dimensions and aspects of which will be covered in the next course of the next few days. Let's begin by asking, what is a river? It has already been asked by Manoj Vishra. Most of us tend to think of a river as a water channel, but a river is more than water, as Manoj pointed out. It is also a transporter of sediment. It's also the riverbed, the banks, the vegetation on both sides, the floodplain, the catchment. The totality of these constitutes a river. A river is a natural, living, organic whole, a hydrological and ecological system. It flows. That is its defining characteristic. As it flows, it performs many functions, supports aquatic life and vegetation, provides drinking water to human beings, their livestock and wildlife, influences the microclimate, recharges groundwater, dilutes pollutants and purifies itself, sustains a wide range of livelihoods, <clears throat> transports silt and enriches the soil, maintains the estuary in good state, provides the necessary fresh water to the sea to keep its salinity at the right level, prevents the incursion of salinity from the sea inland, provides nutrients to marine life, and so on. It is also an integral part of human settlements, their lives, landscape, society, culture, history, and religion. Unfortunately, most people have a simplified, unidimensional perception of a river as a channel carrying water. <coughs> it is this limited perception that enables the engineer to think of a river as a pipeline to be manipulated at will, and the economist to regard it merely as the source of a marketable commodity for human use and trade. Industry thinks of a river not merely as a source from which water can be extracted for its use, but also a drain into which its waste can be discharged. Large farmers want dams and canals to be built for diverting water for irrigation. Small farmers, boatmen, fisher folk, have a somewhat more nuanced understanding <coughs> of and relationship with rivers, but even they do not think twice about dumping waste into the river. As, a, as for large-scale commercial agriculture, trade, commerce, and fisheries, they are no different from industry in their attitude to rivers. Construction people regard the riverbed as a source for construction material. Industry and commerce, builders, developers, ordinary people wanting to own houses, even urban planners and governments tend to look longingly upon the floodplains of a river as so much land lying unused. Floods with which people in earlier times had learned to live and derive some benefit from are now regarded as disasters to be controlled. Their destructive power has indeed increased because of extensive occupation of the floodplains. Consider the things we do to rivers. When I say we, I'm, I'm referring to the whole of humanity, not just to any one group or country. The flows of rivers are obstructed with dams and barrages. The abstraction or diversion of their waters is regarded as the proper use of their waters. In-stream flows, particularly flows to the sea, are regarded as waste. In many cases, they are not allowed to flow into the, to the sea. Their waters are impounded and are diverted, reducing downstream flows, affecting the river regime, harming estuaries, and inducing the incursion of salinity from the sea. They are confined within embankments. 
Loops in rivers are sometimes cut through and straightened. Waste, pollutants, and contaminants are inflicted on them far beyond their coping capacity. The floodplains and rivers are built upon, leaving no space for the accommodation of floods when they come, as they will. Sand is mined from their beds. Bore wells are sunk into their beds for extracting the water below, reducing base flows, and so on. All this is neatly captured in a catchy, light-hearted, but almost epiphanic statement reported to have been made by an American water engineer. He said, we enjoy pushing rivers around. That doubtless represents the attitude of our own water engineers and water bureaucrats, though they may not explicitly say so. The apotheosis of that kind of thinking, that cavalier attitude of manipulating rivers, was reached in the controversial interlinking of rivers project, which was unfortunately endorsed by the Supreme Court in two judgments, exemplifying egregious judicial overreach. The engineering, economic, commercial, managerial, and in general, the instrumentalist view of rivers leaves little room for thinking of rivers as living things, as ecological systems in themselves, and part of larger ecological systems, as having roles to play beyond serving human economic activity, and as having an existential, and not merely an instrumental value. This is illustrated by the controversy about minimum flows. The word minimum has been cosmetically changed to environmental, but the thinking remains the same. Instead of respecting the natural flow and diverting the minimum absolutely and unavoidably necessary, the approach is to abstract the maximum water from the river, grudgingly let flow a minimum. In the controversy about the planning of hydroelectric projects, a suggestion that at least 50% of lean season flows and 30% of high flows should be left free for the river is strongly resisted. To the proponents of such projects, any flow left in the river means so much generation of power <coughs> foregone. They are reluctantly willing to let no more than 10% of the flow go free. And that, too, is a concession to the climate of opinion. Now, turn now to the interstate river water disputes. Why do they tend to become protracted and virtually insoluble? The reason is that the farmers in each state regard the river essentially as irrigation water for their use, and they want to extract the maximum. This becomes part of electoral politics and becomes intractable. The combined demand of the disputing states exceeds the water available in the river. They're asking for water that does not exist. In other words, this is the case of competitive, unsustainable demand for water, or greed, in Mahatma Gandhi's words, distorting and destroying the traditional relationship between a river and the people. Please note, that disputes rarely arise when a river is flowing free, unobstructed by human intervention. They arise as soon as one state begins to build a dam or barrage on the river. It is interesting that conflicts over river waters, whether inter-country or intra-country, seem often to arise in the con context of large projects. Faraka, Baglihar, Narmada Sarda Sarovar, Teri, Mulla Periyar, Parambikulam Aliyar, <coughs> and so on are examples. Karabagh in Pakistan is another example. It would appear that large projects like these tend to become the foci of conflicts. That is essentially because, A, they tend to alter geography and hydrological regimes, sometimes drastically, and B, they involve issues of control, power, and political relations, social justice, and equity. Even the resolution of an interstate or intercountry dispute through an agreed or adjudicated allocation of waters is often a non-ideal way of dealing with the river, reflecting a wrong attitude to it. The allocation of shares to the disputing parties means a chopping up of a river into segments, giving each party a segment of the river to be dealt with as it likes. There is no room here for a holistic view of the river as a total hydrological and ecological system. A development that is fatal to rivers, and I'm treading on dangerous ground here, 
the development that is fatal to rivers is the frenzy to build a large number of hydroelectric projects on rivers to meet the projected energy demand for quote unquote development and economic growth. It is argued and widely believed that hydroelectric projects, particularly run of the river ones, are environmentally benign, that they are green. This is a completely wrong view. First, there is a break in the river between the point of diversion to the turbines and the point of return of the waters to the river. And the break can be very long, even 100 kilometers in some cases. And there will be a series of such breaks in the event of a cascade of projects. Does that river still remain a river with so many dry patches? Secondly, these projects operate as peaking projects, that is, the turbines operate in accordance with the market demand for electricity, which means that the waters are held back in bondage and released when the turbines need to operate, resulting in huge diurnal variations in downstream flows from zero to 400 percent. So there is one case in which the river is dry for 24 hours in the day, and in the remaining four hours, there is an eight meter water wall rushing down the river. No aquatic life, no riparian population can withstand that sort of variation. A run of the river hydroelectric project spells death to the river. And we want to build a whole series of such projects on the Ganga and on the Brahmaputra. And we fight with China when it wants middle one. It might be argued that the imperative of what goes by the name of development demands such interventions in rivers. We have to ask ourselves whether we are prepared to kill our rivers for economic development, whether economic development or human civilization itself will survive the death of rivers, and what kind of development it is that demands the death of rivers. Development also means industrialization, including the industrialization of agriculture and urbanization. And all these lead to the generation of immense quantities of waste of diverse kinds, sewage, effluence, chemical runoff from agriculture, medical waste from hospitals, municipal waste, waste from hotels, and so on. Only a small part of this treated and much untreated and partially treated waste goes into the rivers, reducing to sewers or poison. Even the religious aspect of people's relationship with rivers gives rise to pollution in the form of ritual offerings cast into the waters, the disposal of dead bodies in rivers, and so on. Having practically killed the rivers, we set up river conservation authorities, which remain ineffective because the original causes of pollution and contamination remain unrecognized and unremedied, and also because these are top-down bureaucratic organizations involved, not involving the participation of the people. Another offshoot of urbanization is the shifting of the state's responsibility of providing water to the citizens to private corporate entities. This is often accompanied by the handing over of sections of a river to private hands. This again means the shifting of the state's responsibility for the protection and conservation of rivers to private corporate bodies which may not share these concerns. In addition to all this, we now have the problem of climate change and its impact on rivers, a matter that is currently being studied in various institutions. Let me now briefly refer to some recent developments. The present government has promised to clean up the Ganga and has added the words Ganga rejuvenation to the name of the Ministry of Water Resources. That is a welcome development. If this government manages to restore the Ganga to a reasonably healthy state, it would have succeeded where previous governments have failed. Unfortunately, there are also some contrary indications. First, the new name of the ministry also includes river development. What does that mean? It makes one uneasy because the word development in this context has in the past meant control of rivers through dams and other structures. And that was the approach, among other things, which led to the present plight of the rivers. Secondly, while the Ministry of Water Resources talks about rejuvenating the Ganga, the Ministry of Transport wants to build multiple barrages on the Ganga for facilitating navigation. That might make the Ganga a navigation channel through a major part of its length at the cost of destroying it as a river. 
Thirdly, the controversial interlinking of rivers project is being talked about again, to the dismay of many of us. However, oh, I think one sheet of, ah, there it is. However, I do not propose to discuss these matters at length in this address, as they will doubtless come up for detailed debate during the next four days. My intention is merely to flag the topics. Having catalogued all the ills that plague our rivers, I shall refrain from putting forward remedies. That should come at the end of the discussions during the next four days. Thank you. <laughs>